Wave Act, the web-free software company that understands what you want. Hi everyone, welcome at Wave Act. Today with Dr. Max Bernd, who is the Chief Legal Officer at Blockpit AG. He's also Working Group Chair Advisor at International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications and Partner Senior Associate Attorney at his own company, Dr. Bernd. And today we are going to talk about a super interesting and relevant topic, and that's, as you might guess, regulation in Web3. Thank you, Max, for being here. It's really a pleasure having you on. And starting out, I would love to know a little bit more about you. What are your passions from, I don't know, how does your everyday look like? What are you currently working on? Whatever you want to let us know. Thank you, Kevin, for introduction. Um, hi, guys. My name is Max. I'm Chief Legal Officer at Blockbit. Uh, we are one of the leading, uh, globally leading uh, software providers in terms of crypto taxation. Uh, so what we do on an everyday, so to say, is provide a software as a service application that helps individuals and entities alike uh, with filing their crypto tax declarations. Um, from, from my background, so my passion, I I think you can already see it here. One of my passions, of course, is crypto. This is also why I went into crypto. So basically my background, I come from a legal background. I used to work as a lawyer or I still do sometimes on the side. Um, I'm, I'm based in Vienna, so I'm Austrian. I'm born raised here, um, but I fell into the crypto rabbit hole uh, when I studied in Australia. I did a PhD in Australia and uh, my roommate uh, back then earned quite a lot of money with Bitcoin. So I already heard about Bitcoin. I heard about blockchain before, of course, but I've, ne I've I never really got into it too much. And then um, my roommate told me about uh, Bitcoin. I was like, oh my God, I need to get into that as well, right? Because uh, he was like, yeah, it's so easy. Like, just look at it and it's it's so cool. Um, and that was actually the first time I um, really dealt with blockchain, blockchain-based applications. And back then, Ethereum had already been published so there was also the opportunity to go beyond um, the mere system of payment services as it would be provided by the Bitcoin blockchain and also implement, for example, smart contracts and um, protocols layers uh, to, to the Ethereum blockchain, which, of course, opened it um, to a whole, whole new level. Um, next milestone in this regard, of course, Metaverse, Web3, um, now upcoming decentralized finance something um, which I really deal in with in detail as well, not just from a legal point of view, but also from a technical point of view. And um, because I just really think that this is the next big step, so to say, um, that we are now on the verge of creating a new financial system, um, which is faster, more secure, and actually also when it comes down to the legal aspects of the financial system, more safer. Um, the only thing that we have to provide in this context, of course, is legal certainty. So my background um, at Blockbit is I'm, I'm chief legal officer there. So we are a company with um, roughly 60, 70 employees. Um, of course, I, I handle all the legal stuff that comes with, with such um, a joint stock company, which is quite a lot. <laughs> but besides that, I also work in politics. So I'm a so-called uh, policy maker, or as you would say it um, in, in Brussels, you're a lobbyist, <laughs> which is kind of like has a negative connotation to it um, when it comes down, especially to German speaking countries, because here it's often um, linked with corruption. If you say, oh, I'm, I'm lobbying in, um, in favor of my company or in favor of a certain idea. But actually, and this is something which I really like about Brussels and working with the European Parliament and the European Commission, is that lobbying is treated in a very different way than it is to national states. So basically lobbying there means you are the, you give practical insights on a topic where policymakers don't really know how to deal with it. And that's something very, very important, especially when it comes down to crypto. Um, so what I do is, uh, for example, next week I will be in Brussels. Um, we will have a panel on um, crypto taxation, which in Europe, and I know this is often a discussed topic, like how much should crypto even get regulated? Because one of the key 
um, priorities or key objectives when Bitcoin was first introduced in 28 was to cut out intermediaries, right? It, yeah. it, was, it, it was supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. It was supposed to have some kind of um, certain limacy behind it, so to say, that um, not everyone can see, oh, which transactions do you actually conduct? But on the other hand, and this is something we see right now, of course, there are a lot of concerns, especially by policymakers and in the, in, by users as well. You see it, for example, um, lately with the Terra Luna crash, where a lot of money uh, was lost by a lot of uh, um, crypto users. And um, it was really unexpected because I thought, um, generally speaking, the environment within the Terra Luna ecosystem was quite good. Um, problem was that the algorithm behind it had some major issues and someone took advantage of it. So the whole system crashed. But um, I think this just showed us that we need some kind of protection. And also what we should not forget, and this is why um, legal clarity within the fields are very, very important, is legal certainty and legal clarity is the first step towards mass adoption. It's the first step, for example, for big players to get into crypto and also um, get the verification or like the okay from their compliance departments. Very, very important. Um, yeah, Kevin, do you have some questions? Yeah, 100%. Uh, actually, I have a lot. Um, in general, what's always funny is, as you just said, when you talk in crypto about regulation itself, right? People are always like super offensive or defensive, like, hey, no, uh, we don't need that. Uh, crypto should be like completely unregulated, should be everything, right? But what you just beautifully said is big companies only have the possibility at all to enter the space if it's properly uh, regulated right but now the big question is how much as you teased already is good enough but also less enough that you have the freedom as a company to flourish and build new great products That's exactly so it's <laughs> my take, actually there is no uniform answer to this question of course um this has to be looked at individually but i think what's for example where this is a really hot topic at the moment um within the discussions is the regulation of decentralized finance so for example during the discussions of mika the markets in crypto asset um, regulation back in march there were several maps so members of the european parliament uh that proposed um a, supposed in a, a legislation that would have practically resulted in the ban of um, unhosted wallets, what they called it. Now it's called self-hosted wallets, which is a better term in my opinion, because someone hosts them, so they are not unhosted. Anyways, um, they, they proposed the legislation which would have resulted in their in their ban. So um, that the reason being that they were scared if someone would use a self-hosted wallet um, in order to proceed transactions, that this was, would enable um, people that, for example, are subject to sanctions, like something which is really, really hot topic at the moment because of um, the Ukrainian crisis, um, is that that uh, Russians would start using crypto in order to proceed transactions. So there's always a certain fear when it comes down to policymakers and certain um, certain prejudice when it comes down to crypto assets. So the major prejudice about the crypto assets that we have to keep in mind when talking to politicians is first of all, the environmental impact associated with proof of work. So this is something where a lot of um, parties, especially of course, Green Party would argue that Bitcoin should be banned completely um, because um, from their point of view, it just produces so much energy waste or like has such a high energy consumption that it would result in a lot of um environmental damage which of course if you look at the numbers behind it and looking at bitcoin overall compared to traditional finance it's just not true there's like studies on that there's numbers you can you can provide so much evidence meanwhile but still of course within the heads of of um, policy makers and also within the the minds of of the broad public it's still a big topic and it's something that you as someone that is advocating um towards a more like more implemented uh, crypto market 
you would say you need to have you would look at these concerns and you have to you have to tell people yes of course we understand your um your your worries about about climate change about the climate impact of of proof of work etc but for this and these reasons um these are very very little compared to everything else so this is something very important so you shouldn't just say oh that's all wrong um you that, that's often an issue that we see that a lot of people within the crypto sphere just have this very like black to white approach so they don't really take what people tell them when they say we are concerned about this but they just say oh no it's all bullshit, so we won't talk about it right yeah so this is something which which you learn within policies you have to accept what um, the other person next to you is talking about you have to take the concerns and actually deal with them something very important and this is something of course which doesn't happen from one day to another it's uh, this is this is just how it is you have to you have to tell them over and over again and then at some um, certain point um you you have the success so first thing environmental impact second thing and that's maybe the biggest topic right now is aml so anti-money laundering um and counter um counter-terrorist financing so these are the key um, objectives mostly when it comes down to crypto regulation crypto regulation per se at the moment mainly aims at connecting wallets to people so basically what you see nowadays with every big exchange um, and with every regulated exchange that they would conduct quite comprehensive kyc procedures yeah. so you as a user if you sign up to for example kraken to binance to bitpanda um, wherever you would have to to um, provide them with your with your passport or like your id you have to provide provide them with your state of address and in the future will also have to provide them with your tax jurisdiction for example so that they can provide the government with further information on that and now people are saying okay this is this is actually against the objective that satoshi nakamoto had in mind when he created bitcoin namely that um, there should be uh, less transparency when it comes down to um to transactions or at least um that because because of the way blockchain is built um it's an open book so you can mm -hmm. actually see every transaction that was ever conducted. So of course, this needs to be handled in a different way than it is with traditional finance. But overall, if you ask my opinion, okay, shall we, shall we regulate that? Um, shall we have such a KYC approach? Um, in my opinion, the answer is yes, to a certain extent. Um, namely, um, also, and this is something very, very important in, in centralized finance. So if we're talking about CFI, is that if you look at CFI transactions in general, it's more of the broad public that goes into CFI transactions. So these are people that they usually have less knowledge of crypto and the crypto sphere. So they are more prone to actually using their keys. They are actually they are they are more prone to being subject um, of fraud when for like phishing mails, etc. Because they are just not. To, they are not dealing too much with the situation. They see crypto and say, hey, it's a cool opportunity to invest money. Let us let me invest money because I want to be part of this, this ecosphere, but they don't really deal with decentralized finance, et cetera. So these are, this is what I like always say is the average Joe investor that has to be protected. And yes, there have to be certain laws that protect those people because there were a lot of people that actually got scammed. There are a lot because they were just, they didn't know any better. And how should they? It's still an evolving market. There's still so much that you have to learn about. So it's not something you just jump in from one to the other second. So I think as a certain level of, of first of all, and like um, criminal law regulation is very important, especially when it comes down to mass adoption of crypto. Second, um, second thing that is very important, of course, is customer protection. So that this is this is also why very important um, to have regulated um, exchanges and not not just unregulated exchanges because if an exchange if you see something like mount cox who's going to be liable you have a lot of money in there and it's all gone right yeah so this is someone has to be held accountable very important for customer protection and i'm talking here specifically um about the broad public participating with um with crypto and then on the other hand, there, of course, is decentralized finance. 
or Web 3.0, or like um, what, what we often start with, and this is something very important, is that decentralized finance per se doesn't necessarily mean peer-to-peer -peer transaction, but it means a peer-to-protocol transaction. Because this is something that that uh, that actually a lot of um, a lot of policy makers don't realize at first that when we are talking about decentralized finance, that we are not talking um, person A conducting a, a transaction to person B, but rather that trans that a person A is um, conducting a transaction with a protocol, which is no no um, where you don't have the second party straight away, right? For example, if you would participate in a DAO and a decentralized um, autonomous organization or in any other DeFi protocol. And these kind of subjects, like when it comes down to decentralized finance, of course, have to be dealt with um, from a different point of view. And something where we say, hey, and this is something also the, the, the European crypto community is quite strong about, is that we need certain regulation, but we need regulation that makes sense and also allows crypto and decentralized finance to actually flourish within the European um, market and not ban it. Because sometimes if you say, okay, we ban unhosted wallets, yeah, then of course you wouldn't be able to proceed any transactions from a gatekeeper where you can actually put in fiat into crypto, then um, have um, DeFi transactions, and then, then you try to go back to, uh, to, um, to an exchange in order to cash out, so to say. You can't do it. Basically, you can't do it. So very, very important um, that there are um, certain certain regulations that make sense and that, of course, prevent money laundering, et cetera, from happening. But ultimately, also, if we look at the, the numbers, and these are quite valid numbers, so I can, if, if someone's very interested into, into the criminal aspects of um, of crypto, I always refer to the to the reports that are published on an annual basis by Genesis. Um, these are free for download online, so you can really look at, into them. And they are actually referred to by our like discussions within the European Parliament. They are um, referred to within um, in the discussions in the White House in the US. So they are very valid um, documents. So if you look at these statistics, um, you can really see that um, the crime. <laughs> within crypto is not that high as it's always supposed to be, so to say, by the, by the broad public. So it has to be kept in mind as well. There needs to be sensible regulation that also allows um, new technology to emerge and flourish within Europe and doesn't push away service provider and user from Europe into, into third countries, something that we've seen quite a lot um, with people going to Dubai, for example, where there's a new whole new market emerging um, within crypto. A lot of money going there also for tax reasons, of course. And this is something where we come into play with Blockbit because it's one of my major parts is, is taxation. And I just had um, a call yesterday with a member of the European Parliament. Um, and she's very pro um, a national approach to taxation. So it's a, she says, um, you know what? Um, within the European Union, we have a common ground but when it comes down to taxation, every country should be responsible themselves and decide how much do we want to tax our people. And you can guess from which country from the European Union this member of the parliament was. So there's, there's always like, of course, if, if you are the country that has um, less taxes, for example, crypto, you don't have any taxes at all. You benefit from a lot of people coming into your country and proceeding a lot of payments, buying property, leaving a lot of market, um, money in the market overall. You don't even need to have taxes on crypto because the other money that is spent is so much higher anyways. It's something you could see in Ireland at the start of Web2, where a lot of big companies like Dell, Microsoft, etc. would all settle down in, in Ireland because they have the best taxes, the best tax regime. So, of course, this is, this is a huge topic within the European Union, taxes and no crypto user likes to pay taxes no one likes to pay taxes right yeah. but actually tax is one especially when it comes down to policy making tax is one of the key building stones of progress and this is something which people often forget about why because especially within policy making there's uh, you always have to have a so-called sticks carrots and sticks approach so basically you say okay um 
we provide you with carrots, like with sweets, basically, um, like taxes, like every, every government wants to get taxes. This is basically the best thing that they can get because it's money. Um, and on the other hand, you have to grant us certain freedom. So you have to grant us the freedom of not regulating certain areas in too much detail because it would otherwise re result in this um, environment not flourishing within Europe, but in other countries in the world. So yeah, taxes are quite a big topic as well. I know not many people want to talk about it, but very, very <laughs> Nobody <important>. does. <laughs> it's like from a regulation point of view. Yeah, 100%. Uh, uh, you just triggered a lot of questions in my head. So um, I just want to start with uh, a little note on there. Um, when it comes to taxes, as you said perfectly, they have different functions, right? Um, if you look at simple taxes like uh, the one for cigarettes, they also have some kind of, they try to build intentions as well, right? If you have an extra tax on something, then you want to dis discourage people from doing that, for example, and encourage better behaviors, for example. Or as you said, just fund public goods, I don't know, whatsoever, right? Uh, push the economy, things like that. You, but but uh, referring to uh, a topic that you mentioned before, which was particularly interesting for myself, um, and I might be wrong here, so that's going to be risky for me now. SWIFT, the international uh, system basically for payments, as far as I know, uh, sanctions, for example, don't actually are implemented on SWIFT itself as well, right? Because uh, countries, state, basically it's something that has to be handled nationally and not internationally because of the different jurisdictions and everything. Uh, isn't that the same with blockchain actually? Or what's your take on that? <laughs> no, you can't. You can't really compare those two, um, especially okay. since um, with Swift you can't you can't just sanction Swift. This is not something um, you can. What you can do is you can prevent Swift payments, for example, from Russia to be happening. But if you if you leave a sanction just on Swift, um, every Russian would just use a bank account uh, within China and then proceed the transactions, and then it has a Chinese um, Swift, right? So it's this is something that doesn't work in this way mm -hmm. so you always have to look at the person behind the transaction and this is the same approach they have with transactions coming from from russia at the moment since it's a sanctioned country um so they would look um there's a lot of kyc going on in kyb in particular at the moment it's looking at companies and um, where's ultimate who's the ultimate beneficial owner are there any people um involved that would be subject to certain sanction rules um, to be honest, um, the question if all of these sanction rules are actually legit or if like the, the, the reason behind them or like if they if they are valid the way they are, this is a different topic that has to be discussed in more detail. But um, like I said, if uh, right now this would be approached in a bit different way than with with crypto, um, and mm -hmm. it could be and it can be way more easily identified since you have an intermediary that is obliged to report certain certain key um, parts of the transaction so basically if you are, if you have an incoming transaction as a bank you have to you have to have you have certain aml standards that you have um, to comply with and this kind of the same um, structure is now applied to to crypto as service providers as well and this is why a lot of crypto asset service providers, for example, coming to Europe and um, want to apply for a license here, fail to apply for the license because they just don't live up to the expectations um, that the European countries uh, have in regards of AML, data protection, and so on and so forth. So big, big topic that, that for example, Binance was struggling a long time with. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, thanks for that. I'm talking about KYC, right, and AML. Uh, there are a lot of interesting approaches right now in the crypto sector that try to address that topic somewhat, right, to still retain the decentralization and privacy aspect, but still comply with regulatory frameworks in, in a perfect world. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, are there some... Uh, 
promising technologies of of frameworks of things that you have discovered yourself such as for example that approach where you use so-called zero knowledge proofs if that says something to you where you actually can trans uh, can produce certain claims to prove that you are somebody or that you know something basically versus the reputation approach where people just have that pseudonymous uh, identity on chain where they have some kind of reputation when they pay loans back or things like that and you basically track that and punish that and everything what is your take on that if you have one and yeah how do you view these things um when it comes down to, when it comes down to kyc i think the answer is quite simple uh, like i said it should always be looked at from a point what makes sense so it's it's something that is very individual um that has to be like discussed on the on the case by case basis there's no uniform approach to that either and this is what makes regulation within crypto like since the development of the crypto sphere such a fast paced one makes the regulation of it quite difficult very very difficult in this regard so basically something which is very very interesting for example um since you asked me if i have seen some interesting things popping up lately is that um, big service providers like for example coinbase they just started providing users with self-hosted wallets so what they would do is they provide you with a self-hosted wallet under the framework of coinbase so you can pop in via coinbase you register the self-hosted wallet at Coinbase, so to say, they know it's yours, but every transaction that runs through that um, through the, the wallet is is done completely outside of the regime of Coinbase. So it wouldn't it wouldn't be able they wouldn't be able to to track it. I haven't used this wallet myself. I've just discussed it with some some people from Coinbase themselves, and I I don't know how much they have implemented yet. But ultimately, I think this is a quite good approach when it comes down to, first of all, customer protection, because you can't really lose your keys if it's registered with an official exchange, so to say. On the other hand, it also, of course, you have a door to a gatekeeper. So I think something which is very, very important, and this is, this is um, something coming from a regulatory perspective, is yes um there should be uh, there should be a certain degree of privacy and privacy is, is a fundamental right that should be kept in high regards and it's very very big big topic also in, in europe with a lot of big players coming in from the us that wouldn't treat privacy the way we in europe do it anyways very very important is that there is yes privacy is something very very important but to a certain extent it's okay if i say okay i have a certain wallet this wallet functions as my gatekeeper wallet so basically you have one wallet that is registered and it's the one where i cash in cash out or I, where i conduct my retail payments with so basically if you go shopping right you go shopping and you say okay i'm, I'm gonna go shopping and this 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 wallet as a retail payment if this retail payment exceeds a certain threshold and within the new, for example, within the new um, laws uh, or guidelines, should it uh, just issued by the OECD in regards to tax, the crypto asset reporting framework, um, such threshold would be fifty thousand US dollars. So it's quite high, right? Um, if if a payment exceeds fifty thousand dollars, you actually have to say, okay, this is my name and this is my address and this is where I'm living at, right? And this is fair enough because. Why should I be able to make a private, like a private, a fully anonymous payment, which exceeds 50,000? That's the problem is this is, this just opens way too much possibilities for, for making, um, to, to take for making advantage of such, of such legal loopholes, so to say, and using that for criminal, for criminal purposes. And this is something we don't really want within the crypto sphere either. Because within crypto, what we want is we want to have a certain, we want to create a certain ecosphere, like I said, that is um, stable, that is secure, and that is clear, so to say. And something when I say clear, I mean no one should know if I if I pay like if I'm online in my DeFi and I I have, I have a lot of DeFi transactions done with as many wallets as I want to. No one no one should should see that. There should be certain regulations that keep privacy, of course. 
no question. But once I use these cryptos in order to really make big transactions, there should be a certain threshold. And this is something which will be implemented anyways. Um, there should be a certain threshold where I say, okay, in order to proceed these transactions, either if it's a retail payment or if it's a, um, if I want to cash out in fiat, I have to conduct KYC. And that's okay. Because like ultimately, this is just KYC based on this one wallet. It's not like I can use 10 other wallets in between and no one can, can track my, my transactions if I do it the right way. So it's more about that, but it's it's uh, like what I'm saying is is the is the the shell wallet in between, so to say. And yes, of course, this shell wallet in between should be protected in a certain way when it comes down to privacy as well. No one should see which uh, trans like no one from the outside should see which transactions went in and went out from the shell wallet, so to say. Where I say, okay, I use this wallet for on and off ramp. Um, Make sense? Yeah, one hundred percent. Uh, one thing that comes into my mind right now is when you yeah. said uh, you have that basically gatekeeper wallet, right? Mm -hmm. um, but basically uh, it doesn't really, either it can or should be somewhat private uh, when you are doing on-chain transactions. How, uh, well, how do you basically relate that with technologies such as a protocols like Tornado Cash, for example? I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure uh, you expected that um, because I could basically launder or scam someone for, I don't know, 10K, mm -hmm. use Tornado Cash, have anonymous, uh, I don't know, couple of ETH, and then transform that to my KYC wallet and everything is fine. Um, mm -hmm. don't there actually, what's the actual root of the issue need to be some kind of, because what governments actually are interested in, right, is the origin of the funds, right? Not who you actually are, but actually where do the funds come from? Proof of funds, yeah. Yeah. And, um, thinking of that, could you imagine some kind of future where we actually just need to prove that the funds come from legitimate sources, but not who we are, for example. If the, if the funds come from legitimate sources, but we don't have to provide who we are, that wouldn't work since, um, for example, that wouldn't work with something what, which we have going on right now with the sanctions regime, because you could never ensure that. The problem is that, of course, yeah. you can always put in a third party that would say, oh, I'm the owner, I do the KYC, and then you give the money, uh, hand out the money to someone else. That, there's, there's always ways to avoid certain acts, right? Because you could say, okay, someone does the KYC for me and they actually accept the money and then they hand it over to me. But at least I have one person that I can approach and I can ask, okay, whom did you give the money to, right? So there is already a certain degree of, of, of um, security. And when it comes down to Tornado Cash, you, every single um, on-chain um, like anti-money laundering software like Genesis, um, Cyphertrace, Elliptical, TRM, whatsoever, they can all track that. They can all see that it, it stems from a mixing service. Yeah, that's, that's what true. And this is what I'm talking about. And yes, if I want to, if I want to, um, if I want to use such mixing service, I, I just have to be aware of the legal consequences. And that's my own fault. And if they say, okay, we, we won't cash you out, these assets shouldn't necessarily be fr um, frozen so that you can't use them anymore. But to be honest, if you use a mixing service yourself, and not get the assets from someone else via a legit transaction, then that's a problem that you have to deal with, right? It's something that we see every in everyday life as well. You go like it, no one, <laughs> no one really obeys any speed limits on the highway. Like people always go too fast. And okay, if they are if they are punished for it, they are punished. And that's that's the way it is, right? And on the other hand, we shouldn't say okay, we don't need any speed limits because because no one's obeying them anyways. So. Uh, there, there should be certain regulation, yes, but also on the other hand, and this is something which is, of course, a very delicate topic, is that in, in certain aspects, privacy is something which is very, very important. And it's a fundamental requirement to certain transactions to stay private. So not every mixing service is something which will be used um, for an AML purpose, 
for an ML purpose in this regard, for money laundering purposes. So, there, like I said, again, no uniform answer to that. But ultimately, if I say, okay, I have, I have a certain wallet and I do a KYC, and what also is always connected with that, like, and this is something uh, the, the AML um, procedures by crypto service providers are always twofolded. First one, they are on the, like the first step is you have the KYC requirement, which is the person related meshes. So it's, it's the, it's the wallet related meshes, so to say, who's behind the wallet, who owns the wallet and so on and so forth. The second level is transaction level. So you, you have to conduct, um, appropriate meshes to, to, um, check if, if, um, the proof of funds, so to say, say, okay, this doesn't um, stem from any legal sources or there weren't any privacy mechanisms involved. On the other hand, and this is something also which which uh, which is a rather hot topic at the moment right now, it's discussed a lot in the context of CBDCs. So a lot of um, central bank digital currencies, as they are called, um, are now being, uh, there's white papers being um, evolved in this regard a lot right now. And also um, they're talking about the digital euro, et cetera. And this always opens up the question, how can we make sure that once we have such an e-euro implemented, that not of all of our financial system comes completely transparent. This is something which is very, very important. And there will be certain mechanisms like Tonello Cash that are implemented within the CDDC so that you will get anonymous transactions, um, but still, this, this, um, this, this transactions are in the end supervised by the European Central Bank, since the blockchain is under their supervision. So you have an intermediary, yes. And um, what we don't want, of course, is something like we see in China nowadays, where you have an EN implemented that is partly used for social scoring. So you would conduct certain transactions, and if you are not a well-behaved um, person in the eyes of the government, you will get um, a less social scoring, a lower score. So this is something we definitely want to prevent from happening. So yes, there's always a huge, huge discussions between if like the, the, the criminal law aspect, the data protection law aspect, these are like the two, there's like a big spectrum amongst this, these lines and certain areas need to be regulated more straight and certain areas less strict and something this is something which which can be can be done but it's it's quite an intense way to get there so to say yeah um definitely um in general what we what i think what we see is blockchain itself enables us to go to the extremes right you are either actually somewhat decentralized depending on the infrastructure that we have or you're actually fully observed, <laughs> have no control at all, like even less than you have now. Like for example, with the CBDCs, many people are anxious that their money even gets some kind of expiration date, for example, right? Where you need to spend your wage this month. Yeah, it's just something that crosses throughout the internet, right? But things like that. And in general, just that empowerment on both sides is definitely the challenge to find somewhat the way in the middle, right? To actually comply with regulation, to uh, block or reduce the risk of, uh, let's say, scams, whatsoever, but still give power to the people because that's the only reason actually from the very beginning, besides interoperability, why blockchain actually exists, right? And that's maybe the reason why many people are so, I, I would say even toxic <laughs> now, or, or really uh, offensive about it, right? Um, Absolutely. And, and they have, and like I said, um, for a certain, in a certain aspect, they have their point. But ultimately, we can't have a private, um, a completely anonymous transaction based asset um, around the globe, because human beings by nature are just not perfect. So a lot of people take advantage of such possibilities. And uh, they would just say, Okay, um, let's use that in order to to proceed with 
certain transactions that wouldn't be couldn't be conducted in any other way than by using blockchain based services which provide me with anonymous with the um, possibility of anonymous transactions but like i said this is something which is a quite hard topic to discuss because on the other hand i'm i'm very i'm very very concerned also about privacy it's something we are argumenting a lot for and also um especially when it comes down to the future implementation of um, cbdc's like you said there has to be a certain way that not there, like no one can be really just open up a book and see all of your transactions. That's not the way it works. But ultimately, it will be the same like it is nowadays. Like nowadays, if, if um, you have a judge that says, OK, this person is um, there is there's certain suspicion with like an, there's evidence that there is a suspicion um, that this person is involved into into criminal um, behavior then someone that holds the keys for that has to open up, so to say, the the, the, the blockchain register and, and people can see which transactions you conducted. This is the same as, as um, the, the same way it is in traditional finance right now as since they would approach banks. But they have to be very, very strict compliance standards about that as well. That not just um, if, if someone says, OK, we have a certain sense of suspicion so we can just look into transactions mm -hmm. and a transaction is that that wouldn't make sense either right so it has to be it definitely has to be regulated from a certain point of view but um also we really need to be aware that um like i said privacy is extremely important and um that we should try not to collect all our data within two or three big players from the us like it is in web point two uh web 2.0 so to say uh this is it's something we're trying to prevent from happening in web three sadly we are heading towards this direction but um trying our best to be honest uh like i said i'm really from the politics point of view so as you can as you can see and maybe very different from from most other people you have in your discussions um i'm i'm very like i'm trying also to understand the, the worries that politicians and um, policymakers have when they write down laws, namely that your grandma is using Bitcoin to pay for, for her transactions and to make sure that she is not being part of a scam and loses all of her money, right? Yeah. So that's 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 something, some foods for thoughts. I know that there is certain, certain um, people that say that there should be no regulation at all. It should be all um, pseudonymous, at least, uh, so that you can't even follow transactions. But ultimately, looking at it from, from a modern society day point of view, I think that this won't be enforceable. So we are trying to have a very like an appropriate um, approach towards it and to regulate crypto in a sensible way. I love it. Um... Just to clarify that at that point, I'm definitely not the typical web free uh, maxi or something like that. If if you look at my uh, other podcasts or posts, I basically uh, I'm coming from the web two angle as well, right, to some extent. And uh, the the only thing that I discovered on that discussion now is when we look at all the regulation that is happening right now it's actually focusing on or it is considering crypto like um, regular bank transfers right um, but many people claim it would be actually more comparable to using cash right where you are actually always anonymous you don't see the transactions as well uh, you have your limits maybe right like 10k in, in Europe as far as I know and uh, things like that for sure it's not 100% uh, applicable to crypto because you basically can do transfers all over the world in contrast to cash which is much more difficult but in general uh, there are no answers to it right and that's why it makes the full discussion are interesting mm -hmm. um i have one last question for you and then i don't want you to uh yeah take too much of your time basically 
Um, what we really see, and that's the last thing uh, about privacy, most, like really, I would say 80%, that's just a guess right now, of all new crypto projects are focusing all in on privacy, zero knowledge, more than ever actually, or more than for a while. Let's put it that way. If all these CK solutions, zero knowledge, uh, now on layer twos, where you have anonymous transactions, but they're settled in uh, Ethereum layer one, things like that. Um, could you, or do you think that there could be some kind of middle ground where you are somewhat uh, kyc when it comes to entering the crypto space as it is now, but still observing, uh, let's say, inputs, outputs uh, on layer one, but being private on L2 as long as you can somewhat ensure that there are no, let's say, that the actors on there are somewhat regulated, you know, that they're not, I don't know, that sounds like fancy, like uh, imagination right now, but are there s some things that you could imagine? I try just to chat, uh, to satisfy the people that are watching this right now with somewhat that some of these privacy solutions have a future, right? Because right now it looks like uh, everyone is building on it, but in five years, they all are, are gone, vanished, because regulation is uh, shutting them down. No, like I said, because I think um, there should be certain transactions which should be kept private and where there should be a certain degree of privacy allowed. But in order to enter this space of privacy, then there must be certain reporting obligations to, in order to enter it and to exit it, in order to prevent certain certain um people to get in so to say this is this is one of the key issues here yes um especially this is also when it comes down to reporting obligations that would be applicable to DAOs, right so you would you would have transaction like you would have a, um so, some some DAO, and the question is is anyone if you're taking part of this this DAO and there's some criminal behavior um that is preceded by this DAO, who's responsible uh, are you responsible as an individual or is the DAO as a whole responsible? Certain people now even argue that the DAO itself is an entity containing of all the people that are participating. So there is a lot of, of, um, of, of, um, of thoughts on that right now. There's no clear answer to be honest right now. And I think I think the, third, um, the same thing applies to privacy mechanisms on, on um, layer solutions. Uh, when you have when you have that, maybe you can say, okay, the person that is that is organizing such privacy, um, if it's if it's a start, uh, like if it's a company that would provide for that, then of course yeah. the company would be obliged to uh, would be obliged to report certain transaction behavior, or they would um, be at least um, obliged to report who's participating in this environment. So this is something because they control it; they have controlling influence on this solution. Question is if it's just smart contract based or if it's just a completely DeFi application, then it's way, way harder to regulate. And it's like um, it's a big, a big, big topic right now, because this is something you discussed also, because a lot of uh, these privacy um, crypto initiatives are claiming to be decentralized. They're mm -hmm. claiming we're completely decentralized. There's no like, no one no one can influence any transaction whatsoever there's a new board in 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 the european uh council for that or like a european parliament in uh, from around brussels called dinos um dinos are decentral are like our entities that are decentralized in name only to dino so we're not talking about dinosaurs when we say the word dino but um about the entities of persons like entities of protocols or DAOs that um, uh, they claim that they are decentralized, whereas, for example, more than a, as the majority of voting rights would be held by the same person, by the same entity, um, by the same ultimate beneficial owner, or by the same group of people that would say, okay, we have a syndicate amongst us, so we can we can just take the votes and say, okay, we always get our fifty one percent, so we have the controlling influence here, and no one would know right 
So this is something that has to that um, has to be quite um, thought about as well. But yes, of course, there will be a lot of projects that are trying to hold on to the stick, saying we want to be completely anonymous. But um, and this, like I said, it's not a bad approach because I think privacy is something that should be um, very well treated, so to say. Um, but ultimately. I don't see a future where 100% anonymous transactions would be regarded as legal mm -hmm. if they are not connected to any reporting obligations whatsoever. This is something I don't see as realistic and um, would be very, very difficult um, besides certain exemptions maybe, but who knows? That's uh, definitely going to be a super interesting, let's say, next five years where you see those two factors clash into each other. Uh, yeah, let's see where it goes. Um, exactly. <laughs> hey, thanks, uh, Max, for that great discussion. Really enjoyed it. Learned a lot myself. And yeah, if there's nothing else, maybe some kind of uh, last sentence you want to drop here. Otherwise, I will add all your links that you want me to add into the comment section and description. And yeah, I would say thank you, thank you, thank you. And yeah, have a great day. Thank you, Kevin. It was a big, big pleasure. Um, maybe maybe one, one last sentence since we, we were talking about, um, about our new financial system. Don't forget to report the taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know it sounds crazy because like most people haven't been reporting taxes in the past five years. But also already, especially in Central Europe, a lot of governments, uh, government authorities are really now looking into crypto taxation. It's very, very, very unlikely that any gains um, from before 2020 will be looked at, um, especially if they're not beyond six or seven figures. Um, but everything after that, after the bull run in 2021, be careful. <laughs> yeah. If so, okay. if so, we cover all the assets, all the NFTs, everything. So use blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your, for your time. Likewise. Bye. Thanks. Wave Act, the web-free software company that understands what you want.